In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Today we're going to focus on the gospel um, of the second Sunday of, of the blessed month of Misra. The gospel comes from Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 39. So hopefully you had a chance to review it. Um, it's the part uh, where we're talking about the conversion of, of Levi and the calling of Levi and um, where, you know, the, the old wineskins and the new wineskins and, and those kind of concepts. And so just to remind you, uh, this is the last full month of the Coptic calendar. And during this month, we focus on change. We focus on repentance. We focus on preparing a new life with him. And you'll notice as we start to get closer to the end of the year, as we get closer to the Coptic New Year, um, we focus on the end of times. We, we focus on the, the second coming and preparing for his second coming and preparing for a new life uh, with him. And so <clears throat> a lot of the readings and a lot of the themes of the end of the year is about preparing for a new year of repentance. And as we reflect on our Lord's earthly ministry, he spent a lot of time um, healing the sick, uh, healing the lame, restoring sight to the blind, making the crippled walk, bringing the dead back to life as we were reflecting on Lazarus just a few weeks ago. But it wasn't always a uh, physical healing that he offered, but it was also spiritual healing as well. Um, it was his mission to make the spiritually diseased whole again, right? Your sins are forgiven, right? How, how often do we hear our Lord Jesus Christ saying, your sins are forgiven you? Um, so it was his mission to make the spiritually diseased whole. Um, and then, so we come to the gospel today. And how is it all related? So in Luke chapter five, Luke chapter five, verses 27 to 39, that's the section for today. Um, Levi, he was having a, a big feast in his house. And there was a, a, a huge group of people, of tax collectors and other people at the table with him. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they were complaining against the disciples. And they said, why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and the sinners? And Jesus answered and said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, right? This is verses 29 to 31. And this is where I want to spend time today. Our Lord said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And so Jesus said this in response to the Pharisees who were questioning his disciples about why would their teacher eat with the tax collectors and sinners? Because as we know, you know, this was a forbidden practice according to the, if you were to take a strict interpretation of the Mosaic law. So our Lord is inferring that sinners are sick and they have an illness. And he's also implying that he himself is a physician, the one who can help heal other people. And so this is no surprise because we know from the different gospel accounts that our Lord healed many people. And actually, he foretold this when he quoted for the prophecy of Isaiah a chapter ahead of this. So in Luke chapter 4, our Lord quoted from Isaiah 61. I'll read it to you. He said, our Lord said this, quoting from Isaiah. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And so in the gospel of today, our Lord was responding to the questions about his affiliation with sinners. And Jesus responded to the Pharisees by telling them that he came to save sinners and lead them to repentance. And our Lord compared sin to sickness, and he deemed himself the master physician. And so how is this all put together? In the Orthodox Church, the Orthodox Church is a hospital for the suffering world. If you read a lot of the contemplations of the church fathers, this, this is a common theme, that the church is the hospital. Orthodoxy understands that salvation is a process. It's a process of healing. It's a process of drawing nearer and closer to God. You know, when we attend liturgy, it's like going to the hospital versus some people have the, the mindset that when we attend, when we go to church, it's like going to the courthouse. No, we don't go to church to be judged. 
Attending the liturgy is like going to the hospital, not the courthouse, because there is healing for all those who seek it. But we have to go to the place where the, the, the healer is there, right? You have to go to the hospital yourself. You have to reach the point where you give up trying to heal yourself or you ignore the symptoms until they go away. I know I'm guilty of that kind of stuff, right? There, there has to be admission that you cannot control sickness and acknowledgement that there is indeed a sickness, right? The, the Eucharist, as St. John Chrysostom contemplates, he says the Eucharist, the communion, is the medicine for those who are properly prepared. And we see grace working on us in the church in many ways. It's like the medicine when working through the sacraments of the church. But we need to have the proper guidance so this medicine can be applied properly. And so the great physician, he brings those who are sick with sin to his church. And in the church, we not only receive the medicines that we need, right, the, the mysteries, the sacraments, but we also receive the spiritual advice. We receive the training so that we, um, so that the, minist- the mysteries will be for the benefit of our health and our, for our salvation. Okay, so with all this contemplation, we have a few considerations. First, do I consider myself a sinner, right? Do I consider myself a sinner? The one who is spiritually sick and in need of healing. If not, it's a scary thought. If, you, if not, you don't need him. Because he said at the, at the gospel of today, I have, I have come to call not the righteous, but I've come to call sinners. So if we don't consider ourselves a sinner, the one who is spiritually sick and in need of healing, then I don't need him. And that's a scary thought. Another consideration is, do I consider myself a sinner and in need of spiritual healing? Have I come to the hospital, the church, for treatment? The church has a lot of procedures to treat her patients. For example, one of the procedures that we have is the Holy Unction, the Sacrament of the Holy Unction. This is one way, um, and this is the one where we turn to when we're physically sick. But what do we do if we're spiritually sick, right? When we feel overwhelmed by temptation, when we feel overwhelmed by sin, when we feel overwhelmed by temptation, when we, when we feel overwhelmed by sin, hurt other people, do we turn to the mystery the sacrament of confession to pour out our hearts and become to accountable to our spiritual fathers? Do we turn to the mystery of the Eucharist to receive, as, a, as the priest says to everyone who receives communion, the remission of sins and eternal life? Right? These are the only sacraments that the church can provide that we should take of repeatedly and on a frequent and regular basis. Another consideration. If I am a sinner and I do come to the church for sacramental healing, how am I treated? And, you know, when we think of the medical staff, the church's medical staff, who do we think of? Is it the priest? Is the priest responsible for the, and all the functions of the church? Is it the Sunday school servants? Is it the head of servants, right? Yeah, and yes, I, I'm calling up, you know, probably some of the most uh, important, influential people of the, of the church. But in truth, we are all members of the church hospital. We're all members of the staff. We all have a responsibility to care for those who come to us, whether they are members or visitors or people who are just simply curious, right? And the best way that we can be prepared to help them is if we ourselves have sought out and received healing. Notice I didn't say that, you know, necessarily that we are the ones who memorized all the things of the church fathers or, you know, all, all, that, all that stuff that we, we kind of, we put on a pedestal, which is good. It's, there's nothing wrong with that. But I said, the best way that we can help and be prepared to be a staff member of the hospital is if we have sought out and received healing. This is the most qualifying act that you can do to be part of the hospital staff. You know, what would you think of if you went to the Kaiser or to the UCLA Medical Center and you went to the reception desk and it was empty and the halls were empty and there was no one in the exam rooms, right? You'd feel pretty strange. You'd feel like you were in the wrong place. Think about that when when our visitors come, our guests, 
come for liturgy at seven o'clock or eight o'clock in the morning on any given liturgy that we have. And only just a few members of our hospital staff are present. It, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel comfortable. It feels like something is wrong. And so what if you went to the hospital and the nurses and, and the doctors were coughing and sneezing all over you? Can you imagine during this pandemic that if, if the hospital staff was like coughing and sneezing all over you? What would you, what would you think of if the doctors had like gaping wounds about them, right? A healthy hospital has a healthy staff. They also have a well-trained knowledgeable staff. And so what if your nurses were not sure where or like how to inject the needle for the IV? Like what if the doctor didn't know the anatomy that well of the human body and they didn't know which organ to operate on? No, a healthy, well-trained staff also applies to the church. And so I would encourage everyone during this time of, of pandemic and home church and things like this, that we really uh, take it as an opportunity to get closer to the church and we study the church and we go deeper in our studies. We don't just wait and, and kind of uh, be passive during this time. It, it can be a very blessed time. And so we should seek out the physician immediately. I know that some of us might think and use the argument that like, I'm unworthy. How can I go and approach communion? And so you discipline yourself and you say, I'm unworthy to go to communion. Well, it's true. I mean, no one is ever saved because they were worthy, right? No one is ever saved because they're worthy. Even though that we're unworthy, do we still, like, do we still need a, a savior? So being conscious of this need is all the worthiness that sometimes we require. It's just that we need a savior and that I am unworthy. Um, if you need Christ, then you're fit to come to Christ. I'm going to say that again. If you need Christ, then you're fit to come to Christ. If you need to have your sins forgiven, then you are fit to have Christ deal with you. You know, maybe that you're going to say uh, that your case is very complicated and you don't even understand it yourself, but he understands it. I, I heard it once said, you cannot tie a knot of sin, which Christ cannot untie. You cannot tie a knot of sin, which Christ cannot untie. Christ can cure your disease, whatever it is, even if it's become chronic. Our Lord can cure habitual sinners. Now, I, I'm going to uh, switch gears a little bit and go into story mode. I know I, I don't typically do that, but I came across this, um, this like illustration, this passage, and I, I thought it really highlighted the points. I, I'm not going to take credit for uh, what I'm about to read, and it's kind of lengthy, but we'll go through it um, because I, I have a captive audience. And so it's a little bit long, but I, I hope that we can kind of stay with me. And I, I, I really do think it highlights the points that we're trying to illustrate today. So imagine uh, a wealthy landowner, he lived on a beautiful estate near a small city. And from time to time, he would drive into town and talk with his friends and visit the shops and see local people. And you know, he was saddened because a number of the people that he saw on these trips, he would see them sick and, you know, they were coughing and there was fevers and there was crying and people limping on the streets. And he just was amazed that there was no hospital to help these people anywhere in the city. And so with great compassion for these people, this man decided to build a hospital with his own money and he spared no expense. He built state-of-the-art facilities. He purchased the very best equipment and hired some of the most skilled doctors. And he also set up a trust fund that would be able to be used to cover the medical bills if anyone couldn't afford to pay. So once everything was ready, he published pamphlets all over town, letting people know that the hospital was open. And he watched to see how many people would come for help. And he was so happy to see people checking themselves into the hospital. And the nurses and the doctors were working on the wounds and giving medicine and performing these operations that were life-saving. But then he also was shocked to see how many sick people kept just walking around town, not going to the hospital at all. And he couldn't, he couldn't bear to see them you know, remain so sick when help was so close. And he sent several of his doctors into town to talk to the people and invite them in. He would, the, the doctors would say, sir, would you like to come to our clinic? And maybe one person would say, uh, your clinic is not that comfortable. I'd rather be at home. 
I'd rather be at the bar. I'd rather be at shopping. Okay, miss, would you like to come to our clinic? I'm not interested. There's a better clinic down the road. They give me morphine whenever, whenever I want, and it makes me feel better. To the next person, pardon me, would you like to consider to come to our clinic? Uh, no, thanks. I, I'm trying alternative medicine at home. Why won't you come to receive treatment at our clinic, right? I, I feel fine. There's nothing wrong with me. And, and so one by one, these people, these people passed away. And on the death of the fourth person that we illustrated, the entire town was upset. And they went against this man, this wealthy man. And an angry mob formed around the hospital and they had picket lines blocking those who would enter the church, or sorry, into the hospital. And amazed, the man walked out of the hospital and confronted the crowd. The crowd responded violently. They threw insults at him and, and they made fun of him and they mocked him. And they, every time that he tried to speak, they just shouted him down and they wouldn't listen. So he went back into the hospital and decided to try for another day. A few days later, a new pamphlet was given throughout the town announcing that a public meeting would be held and at which this man would be happy to answer any questions that people might have. But he said, please give me the questions ahead of time so he can sort the letters and, and kind of go to the most frequently asked questions. Okay, so the, the questions were sent in, the date was set, everyone in town showed up for this event. So he stepped on the microphone and he said, my dear fellow citizens, I am here today to show you my heart. Over the past few days, I have been grieved to read many of your letters, which reveal a big misunderstanding, far greater than I could have ever imagined. And as I promised, I will share the most frequently asked questions. And I pray that you'll be satisfied with my answers. He says, many of you asked the following questions. Number one, why don't you make the hospital more comfortable? Number two, why don't you attach a shopping mall and a bar to your hospital to make it more fun? Number three, why don't you offer morphine like the other clinic down the road? Number four, why don't you just tell everyone how to treat themselves at home and use whatever alternative treatments they prefer? And the most serious one that he received was this. A few weeks ago, we saw your doctors talking to our friends in town and after they refused to come to your hospital, they died shortly afterwards. We think your doctors must have poisoned them. Even if you don't agree that, you know, with the way that they're seeking medical treatment, it doesn't give you the right to put them to death. Why did, you, why did you kill our friends? When they refused to come to your hospital, why did you condemn them to die? In response to many of your questions, I offer the following clarifications, this man said. Good hospitals are focused on healing, not comfort. If the hospital was full of recliners and big screen TVs, it would be like a living room in your house. It wouldn't be a hospital. If it was a shopping mall or a bar, it wouldn't be a hospital. Good hospitals are focused on curing the disease, not masking symptoms. If we just gave you a shot of morphine so that you might feel healthy for a while, you wouldn't be healthy. There are some medicines actually that make you feel sicker while you're taking them, but they cure the underlying illness. The hospital is here to heal you, not just make you temporarily feel better. Good hospitals are staffed with experienced doctors, not amateurs. If we sent our books and our medicines to every home and let people administer their own treatment, most of them would end up hurting themselves, right? We use powerful medication that has to be administered with care and with great wisdom it wouldn't be safe for people to write their own prescriptions. Your friends died of their illnesses, not for anything we did. We invited people to come to our hospital because we want to cure them. But if they are not willing to come to our hospital, it is not be possible for us to give them proper treatment. We do warn people when they are in danger of dying, but we are not the cause of their death. And so some people understood and more people enter the hospital. Others refused. Some people refused to believe this good man and they plotted against him. And late at night, a group of people broke into the hospital and stole many of the books and stole the medication. And over this, the next several months, they had competing hospitals all over town. And each competing hospital was different. 
Some hospitals were only interested in money, charging top dollar for their services. Many hospitals had caring people who wanted to help, but they were improperly trained. And there weren't enough stolen medications to go around, so each competing hospital only had an incomplete selection. So in hopes to make the medicine stretch further, many of the hospitals diluted the medicine so that they can give it to more people. And so these competing hospitals were very popular. Some had recliners, some had big screen TVs, some of them had morphine as an option to make people feel better. Some of them went to them because there was a closer drive than the original hospital. And so meanwhile, the original hospital always remained in operation. And anyone who checked in were eventually cured as long as they were faithfully taking the prescribed medications. Many lives were saved. And so, and so, as we reflect on this illustration and this story, I hope the points are obvious. The Orthodox Church is the good hospital. The Orthodox Church is the good hospital and is the original place of healing founded by our Lord Jesus Christ himself. He did not intend the church to make us feel comfortable, but he created the church to be a true place of healing. He did not set up the church to teach people how to self-administer spiritual remedies, but he gave the church to provide healing. And so in the Orthodox Church, God has given us the sacraments, the medicine, which are prescribed for your healings. And without taking your prescribed medications, how are you going to find healing, right? When the, when the doctor, right, in this illustration, the priest, when the doctor gives you your prescriptions, you have to take it to its full course. Sometimes the prescriptions are labeled as prayer. You have a certain prayer rule. Sometimes your prescriptions are in the form of scripture or spiritual readings or sermons or different acts of service or certain tithing, right? There, certain, there's, there's different prescriptions that are given to people um, based on their symptoms. And so sometimes we take the one that feels most comfortable to us, the one that doesn't make us feel uncomfortable. And then we complain that nothing is going, nothing is fixed. I still feel the same way. I'm still repeating the same sins. Well, yeah, we're, we're not taking the full dose of medication. Please, I, I just beg everyone, settle for nothing less than the original hospital founded by our great physician. And I'll leave you with this um, saying from uh, Eastern Church Father. He said, are you fighting against your passions? Fight, fight, be good soldiers of Christ. Do not give in to evil and do not be carried away by the weakness of the flesh. During time of temptation, flee to the physician, crying out with the Holy Church, our mother. Oh God, number me with the thief, the harlot, the publican, and save me. And glory be to God forever. Amen. I hope that wasn't too long, and I hope that uh, that we're okay with that. So.